you know, I thought I could will my way to success because at that point I'd only been successful. It was kind of my first failure. Um, and the second thing is I felt like I let down a bunch of people. I let down all these fans that had given us their money to get close to the acts that we had promised them they would get close to. And then when that didn't happen, I had to turn around saying, sorry, uh, I know you're paying us $29 a month to do this. Uh, it's not going to happen. Here's your money back, whatever we had left of it, because we did start paying people back. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Peter Zorgenfrey is a dynamic entrepreneur, business leader, and mentor renowned for his multifaceted career spanning over two decades. He has founded six companies in multiple countries, is the former CEO of a company with 70 employees, and was the youngest manager in Toyota history. He is now a CEO and founder coach, helping them to navigate obstacles, unlock their potential, and have better life balances. He's also grown a reputation for his writings on business and has a newsletter with over 10,000 business people subscribing to it. In this episode, Peter candidly shares his challenges he's faced throughout his career, including getting sacked by his board as CEO after suffering a significant stress-related illness, having to close down a music label that he founded, which he loved due to wrong assumptions about product market fit, and seeing another company that he was CEO of having to close down and run out of cash due to a major disagreement amongst board members. This is a really insightful and fascinating conversation with a serial founder and senior business leader with so much experience and stories to share. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. This is Beyond the Fail with Peter Sorgenfry. Peter, thank you for joining me and taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you're on business at the moment in America. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So Peter, take us back. Where, where did it start for you in business? Well, I guess it started when I, by accident, ended up in the United States before finishing my master's degree in economics. Um, I got an internship opportunity, was supposed to be in Berlin, Germany. I'm from Denmark. I studied in Denmark. And two months before I was supposed to start, they suggested I come to America instead and work over, over there. Um, never been to the United States went to the United States, thought I was going to be there for six months. Six months turned into 13 years, multiple companies, um, a family, and and this career that I'm now on. So it sucked you in. It, it did, you know, and, and it's kind of funny. I, I tell the story a lot, right? Six months turned into 13 years. Just think about that for a minute. 13 years is a long time, but you end up, of course, finding something you love professionally and, and eventually at that age, I was in my late 20s, early 30s, you also find find your, your partner and your family. Um, and so that was just a, an adventure. And then I ended up spending three years in London after that and, and uh, essentially uh, built companies in, in three different continents over a 20-year period. Had you always had the feeling that you would go into business though? Was it always kind of in your plans and you in your heart? It, it kind of was and it wasn't. You know, I'm from a family where there weren't that many options in terms of what to study, right? You're either going to be a lawyer or a doctor or, or an economist. Um, we don't have any entrepreneurial blood in my in my family. Nobody has done their own companies. Um, so for me, it, it was also a little bit of a, an accident. I had a I had a job on Wall Street. I was an equities analyst at UBS, the investment bank. And I hated it. I mean, it wasn't for me. And so... Being young and not thinking too far ahead, I quit. And then I had to figure out to do something else. And that's when I started my first company is in my late 20s. Why did you go into Wall Street then if you, you know, or did you, I presume you didn't know you weren't going to like it? Well, I didn't know I wasn't going to like it, but I did it for the money. Mm, right. um, I, I learned as a, as a young man to, to not work for money, so to speak, right? Because I had a good job. I was working at Toyota. I was 
very successful there, the youngest manager in the history of the company and, and great bosses, great colleagues. But then the bank essentially offered me, you know, three times my salary and, and twice that of bonuses. And so I went for the, for the dollar and the prestige. Um, but the environment wasn't for me. The work wasn't for me. And after 14 months, you know, I'd lost my hair and my waistline and I quit and, um, and I had to figure out to do something else. What did your parents think about you moving to America and, you know, working on Wall Street and everything else that followed? They've never actually expressed what they think. So that's a good question. Um, you know, my mom, I think, missed me. She she visited 14 or 15 times in 13 years. So so that was good for her. She got to travel there. Um, I think, honestly, they've worried with me starting new companies and doing new things. They've worried that I would make ends meet, you know, and, and thankfully I have, but more, you know, our parents, my parents were born in the forties, right? They, nobody started their own companies unless you were the cobbler or the baker. Um, and so for them, it, it was more a worry that would I survive? Would I make ends meet? And, and, uh, thankfully today they, they know that I'll be okay. And I mean, are they supportive of your, I mean, you said they were worried about you starting new companies. What, what is that concern? And has there been any pushback ever that, you know, they've said, actually, I don't think you should, you know, be in business or be an entrepreneur ever? Uh, I think the worry is the same as, you know, I don't know if, if you've kids, we haven't covered that, but I'm a parent and, and obviously I want my son to be happy and healthy. Um, for the older generation, happy and healthy means steady job, steady paycheck, that kind of thing. So they were worried that I, that I wouldn't make money or that I would be stressed or, or otherwise not have the best life I could have. They still question it. You know, my dad still sometimes says, well, you know, are you, are you really sure you enjoy what you're doing? And I'm like, yeah, I'm having the time <laughs> of my life and I have been for 20 years. Um, so I don't think they'll ever stop worrying, uh, as parents. But they also have seen, certainly in the last four or five years, the impact I've had on other people's lives. And I think they're proud of that. Um, and now they know that paying my mortgage is, is no longer a concern. And just thinking back, kind of, I suppose, not just about your family, but uh, uh, maybe culturally as well. Um, you obviously grew up in Denmark, and I don't know much about the sort of culture of entrepreneurship in Denmark. It'd be interesting to kind of for you to say a little bit about that. And as a sort of follow up question, did you need to go to America to start the companies that you started? Or do you think you could have started them in Denmark? Uh, that's a great question. I would never have started a company if I hadn't left. You know, studying what I studied, you would either go work in government or if you were smart enough, which I wasn't, you would have been hired by McKinsey or a place like that, right? That's what people with my educational background would do. When I left Denmark in 2000, I didn't know anybody who had started their own companies. That, that We didn't have a culture of startups. When I came back in 2016, everybody has a startup. Everybody's doing something. So if I had not left, I would not have started my own business. Um, and and so no, there is no culture, or there were no culture of being an entrepreneur, uh, unless you were a tradesman of some sort, right? Um, we have a bunch of really great engineers in Denmark. We have a great engineering culture, but those people would go work for larger companies, um, mm. and not work for themselves. And I suppose that having that lack of culture of startups in uh, I suppose in history, because obviously you say it's different now also means that is quite an alien concept to your parents. Uh, absolutely, right? My my mom was a school teacher. Her, her father was a, a salesman. My mom was a homeworker. My my dad's father, my grandfather, was a, a quite accomplished uh, uh, geologist, actually found the oil in the North Sea, which is, is a side story. Um, and and his, his wife was also a teacher, uh, my grandmother on that side. So... Nobody had done their own thing. Um, and actually, of my siblings, uh, which I have three, nobody's done their own thing either. Right. So, they've, they've all stayed? They, they, well, they've had different experiences internationally, but more of a shorter sort of exchange program nature. 
I'm the on, only one that's been crazy enough to stay away long enough to to actually build my own stuff. And you said you you know you were there or have been in America for what thirteen years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what kind of like kept you there? Was there any moments that you thought actually I'm uh, you know I should get out of this you know this uh, madhouse or I was going to use the word madhouse. I thought of whether you know I. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was the right word to use, but like, you know, the, the, the intensity, I'm sure, because, you know, you talked about culturally how different it is, I'm sure, to, to, to Denmark. Did it ever get too much? No, I don't think so until the end. At the end, it kind of, I was ready to leave. Um, mm. I, I ended up meeting someone and, and we started a family together and she wanted to move pretty much from the moment I met her. Uh, to Europe and ideally right. to Denmark because of the quality of life and all sorts of other mm. things. And I was the one saying, no, actually, I, I don't want to move to Denmark. If if we're going to move away from the United States, I want to move to Japan or Australia or mm-hmm. something because I've always had this sense of, of adventure and experiencing new cultures. Um, business-wise, for me, you know, I didn't want to, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. America is great for you if you are uh, willing and able to endure the pressures of not having a social security net, for example, and you know you have a little bit of hustle in you. And I did uh, back then, and I wanted to do that back then. So no, I I never thought of leaving um, all those years until at the end when when she essentially put her foot down and saying, "We now have a young son. Yeah. Uh, he should he should live and learn Danish. Let's move to Denmark." And I, even that plan, I kiboshed because <laughs> we we made a pit stop in London for three years before we eventually meant to went to Denmark. Very, very, yeah. That's a very short pit stop, three years, right? Um, well, I suppose for you, maybe it is compared to 13 years. Take us back to, to that, that business, that first business that you started after you left Wall Street then. What was it? So it was a market research, competitive intelligence and corporate strategy firm, essentially I'd gotten the idea from working. I also worked at Toyota. I worked on Wall Street, but before that, I worked at Toyota. And at Toyota, I was in charge of studying the future of America, essentially. You know, look out 50 years in the future, figure out what might going to happen with consumers, with competitors, with regulators, and then help Toyota Brass in Japan develop new products and services for the North American market. So Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And I thought, I love that work. Could I do this on my own? So when I was quitting Wall Street, I essentially called up people I'd met over the years and said, I'd like to do this kind of work. I'd like to understand human behavior, couple that with product and service development and competitive intelligence and help you build better products and services. Would you hire me to do that? Again, 28 years old, 29 years old, didn't know any better. Um, And some of them said yes. And so... That was a consultancy that did that kind of service. So I competed with the likes of IDEO and to some extent, some of the blue chip consultancies, BCG and McKinsey and Bain, those kind of places. And I usually said to folks that would listen is, I essentially get them 80% of the way there for 20% of the cost. Uh, that was what my business did. And that, and that became quite successful. So what success did you see and how long did it take? Well, I quit on a Friday. I had my first pitch on a Tuesday and my first contract the following Thursday. So, (laughs) yeah, dumb luck, right? Um, And and the the first job was to do a longitudinal study of dual income, no kids households in North America to help understand what happens to the personal economic so and so forth. so that was easy, right? I, I And I remember the contract was for 60,000 US dollars, which at the time was a lot of money, still is a lot of money. And it essentially required me to work for a month and a half. And so I right. thought, this is easy. And then I started playing a bunch of golf and I forgot to business develop. And then a few months later, I was like, shoot, I have to go out and find more business. Um, and so, yeah, so that's why, that's how I got started. And where did that take you, that business? Where did it go? Uh, I, I spent six years doing it, and then eventually uh, I sold it to a, another larger competitor of mine. 
who then six months later got bought by an even bigger global competitor of theirs. So I was bought and sold twice in six months, and I ended up becoming a corporate executive for a few years during my earnout in the bigger business. Um, and and uh, yeah, that was basically it for that company. All right. And did you ever take on staff, or was it just always? No, I, I, I ended up having staff uh, in that company. Um, learned a bunch of that uh, of, from mm. them, from, from hiring those people. Um, and some of them went to do their own companies, and some of them went to do uh, the same kind of work, but at, at other competitors. And one thought I had was two things, and they're interrelated. You left Denmark at a, you know, a young age and stayed there for a while. And then you started a business, you know, consultancy, trying to compete with some of the biggest names in consultancy in America. Both of those are quite ballsy moves, right? You know, it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of kind of confidence to go, well, I'm just going to leave my, you know, going to leave my home, my home country and, you know, not, and that wasn't a planned move. And then I'm going to start this company at, at 28 and, you know, take on the big boys. Where did that, um, that, that, I suppose that level of confidence, um, come from? You make it sound like it was planned, right? <laughs> you make it sound like I, I, so I, I, when I reflect on this and I have in the past, I'm like, I think I did it because I didn't know any better. I mean, the, the beautiful thing about youth is you have, you know, you climb that tall tree, not thinking about you might fall down and break your neck. Right. Mm. And so when I got the offer to go to the United States, I'd never been to America. So my impression was that America was a bunch of, of quite heavy people, you know, carrying guns. Yeah? And obviously America is much more diverse than that. And, and everybody knows that today. But back then I was like, let me go see what's there and what that could be like. Um, and I didn't mind you, I didn't think it was going to be forever. Um, and, and starting the company was a little bit the same thing. You know, I, I owned an apartment in Brooklyn at a time. Right. So, you know, thankfully, but I, but I still had obligations. I just thought I could make it work. Where does that confidence come from? I think it comes from my parents. Honestly, I think it comes from particularly my mom who I grew up with my mom as a single mother with me and my sister. And my dad was very much in my life, but back then in the seventies and eighties, he was, you know, I saw him every other weekend and, and, and we have a fantastic relationship, all of us, but my mom was really good at encouraging sort of an incurable optimism. She always talked to us about, you know, it'll work out, it'll be okay, you know, apply yourself, things will, things will happen. And she had an incredible work ethic. Uh, she, she still has, she's still alive, but she's no longer working. She worked two jobs to support me and my sister. Um, and, and so I just think that, you know, my parents always said, if you, if you apply yourself, you can make something happen. And so I think that's what drove me to, to do these things. Mm. I mean, you said, um, you said it wasn't planned. Do you, do you view businesses differently now that you set them up are you doing it in a very different way because it sounds like that first consultancy business was very organic and you saw an opportunity you've done it before and has your approach to starting new companies changed now i i wish i could say it's been more it's more planned it's not um you know i'm almost 50 years old now and i i know about myself that i'm very much driven by by interest and desire not so much seeing an opportunity in a market after studying it so the, the subsequent companies that I got involved with was because somebody else told me, hey, we're doing this business. Do you want to be part of it? Mm. And if I liked the people and if I liked the idea, I would say yes, without actually knowing, is this going to be a, a great business or not? Mm. Um, and I actually think that's symptomatic for a lot of companies. If you look about you know some of the most well-known companies today, whether it's Twitter slash X or whether it's Facebook or whomever, right? Most of those companies started doing something vastly different than they do today. Most of those companies started doing something that turned out not to be the greatest business, but along the way they understood and what's now famously, then they pivoted, right? Mm. And, and I think that's true for me too. It mattered mostly that I could do something that I found interesting and fun, 
and then we figure out how to make that profitable along the way. And so right. today, as I work with founders and CEOs, I remind them of not holding on too tightly to their belief of what their company is going to be, because chances are it's going to be something massively different. And it matters more that we actually make smart choices in the day to day than worrying about whether or not we're going to take over the world in two years. Yeah, that's interesting because it's so are you not necessarily is your approach to business not underpinned by a belief that you know the you need to have a big kind of company goal and the, also the the people founding it need to essentially have a kind of 10 15 year plan in their life and it all fits together really nicely well you you can you can tell yourself that you can have a 10 year plan but in most startups you don't know what's going to happen in 10 months mm. uh so so my the thing that i look for today and that i would invest in and and that i would work on is does this problem that we're trying to solve, does that matter to enough people or does it matter to society in a way that it makes it worthwhile to pursue? Mm. How we're going to do it, what our solution for that is going to be, we'll have to figure out. You know, so so I I, I use a little, you know, despairingly and, and I don't mean to insult anybody, but I would not be interesting in another interested in another dating app. Or interested mm. in another, you know, electric scooter company, because plenty of people have kind of tried to solve that problem. But if somebody comes to me and saying, you know, I have an idea for how we can reduce carbon emissions from something, mm. then I'd be like, all right, that's an interesting problem. Now, how would we go about doing that? That's that's how I would look at business today. Yeah. So very much from a from from a problem solving point of view. But I mean, how do you how do you measure some of that? How do you know whether it's a big enough problem? How do you know whether it's a you know big enough like you know market? Is that where your market research analytics background comes in as well, or is it sometimes a bit finger in the air and just making some big assumptions? Again, sorry to disappoint uh, people who think that <laughs> you can figure everything out. I think for most of us, honestly, it's a finger in the air, right? Um, and I just mentioned some climate related stuff. Everybody and their brother knows that the climate is 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 a challenge or the way that we affect the climate is a challenge. Uh, so, you know, some people still believe don't believe in in in, in climate change and, and that's fine. Um, I happen to do. So so I anything that could help alleviate that, I would I would be interested in working on. I, I recently worked with a company that does, you know, sustainable housing, right? So that's an interesting problem. Can we build a build environment more sustainably? Mm. Um, so no, I think understanding whether the market is there is is more of a looking out into the world and just saying, do I believe? And if I can convince myself of something, I'll work on it. Um, and I think that's true for many entrepreneurs. Is there been times where you've got that wrong? Uh-huh. Yes. The good news is, when, when I started my first company, my responsibility was to, to you know, forecast the world 25 years out. Mm, yeah, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, yeah. what did you predict? Yeah, we're years away. So oh, okay. I, still have, uh, I still have a perfect record in, in many ways. Um, yeah, I, I think I think you get it wrong every day, honestly. You know, um, the, 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 the challenge then becomes, or, or the, the thing that makes you survive is not to make bets that are so big that they cannot be recouped or reversed, right? So imagine this, you go to Las Vegas, some people will put everything on red or green or, or maybe even black if they're nuts. Uh, no, sorry, green if they're nuts, I guess that's the zero. But I would never do that. I would rather make smaller, more calculated bets, see if they pan out, and then reiterate on that, um, which is also why it's really dangerous when you meet founders or entrepreneurs who have a very set vision, right? So I'm saying, we're going to do this this way, and we're going to invest $10 million to do it, and it's going to happen in two months. In, in some ways, the assuredness, if, if somebody's too assured of an outcome, that's a huge red flag for somebody like me because I just know that will not happen. I'd rather that they say, I have no idea what's going to happen. I have no idea how much money it's going to cost. I have no, all this other stuff. 
but I'm going to spend a little bit of money trying to do this specific thing. And then we'll see if that pans out. And if it does, then we'll go keep going. I think that's a better approach to building companies. So it's the lead startup method of, of constantly kind of testing and experimenting and trying and getting uh, feedback and, and traction. It, it absolutely is. The, the the next problem there, which we can also talk about, is a lot of people actually say that they apply that. The problem is they never expose what they're doing to the outside world. So in, in recent years, build in public has become a thing, uh, you know, and, and it's become a thing because people understand that the more you open up, the more data you get back about what actually might be working. And so rather than saying, we're, you know, being in stealth mode is also a thing that I feel is kind of ridiculous because there's somebody else out there who has the same idea that you do. Mm -hmm. And if you're an engineering genius and you discover the cure for cancer, chances are nobody else will, right? So you can mm -hmm. talk about that. Um, but, but, but being open and public about what you're doing actually allows you to expose it to customers, right? There's a lot of companies that say, yeah, but we just need to fix the website or we just need to fix this and the other. I'm always like, no, put out what you're doing, show people all the flaws. It humanizes you and it humanizes the product and you're going to get feedback and input that's going to be vastly more valuable than you staying inside your company for the next six months burning who knows how much money before it's exposed to the world. And how do you sort of advise people put themselves out there? Is that social media what what does that kind of look like in practice it, it can be anything um you know social media is 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 wonderful for many things but i think you know i would rather see somebody use my product so i would invite people in and i wouldn't do focus groups and, and all of those stuff. i would just say here jeremy here's an example of something i'm working on what do you think well peter i think the font should be bigger i'm like okay thanks that that's not super helpful but would you use something like this? Or, uh, what, you know, what is this that I'm building? Or, you know, just ask, ask open-ended questions. And I think that's my market research background. One of the things I learned there is you can tell, you can get people to say anything you want them to say. That's not valuable. But getting them to say what actually matters to them is the trick. And so when you're building something for somebody else, just giving it to them and observing what they do with it and how they talk about it will give you data that you cannot get by asking them questions, if that makes sense. Mm. So it, again, it's a bit more of an organic approach. Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I learned that at Toyota. I spent, when I worked at Toyota, I spent six months essentially living with morbidly obese people to understand what their life was like in the context of driving an automotive vehicle, right? Of driving right. a car. At no point did I ask them anything about the car. I was just there and we talked about their lives and, and I and I followed along. I rode along with them, obviously, but I was also in their houses and I learned a ton about what it means to be massively obese. And so when you drive a Toyota product today, things like the seatbelt, things like the left side in in the in the countries where we're driving the left side, the, the left side of, of the seat is reinforced in a way that you have no idea, but that's because I observed that if you're heavy, you wear down that side of the seat much faster. And so the experience you get as a small example, but you can see a lot of things when you spend time with people and listen to them without prompting them and asking them questions, right? Um, yeah. And and so that's kind of a philosophy that I, I bring to, to new products and services today. I force people and companies to expose it to their audience physically if they can and just see how they use it that's fascinating well just a yeah a, a question about toyo obviously it's a very kind of innovative forward thinking um company as a whole you know the japanese philosophy of of innovation um you know it, it is a sort of fascinating subject itself and could be a whole uh you know i'm sure it actually is a book and and things like that but <laughs> what, what what were the what were some of the key things you learned working at toyota so there's a book, it's called The Toyota Way, and I'd yes, encourage it, you to, yeah. you know, your listeners sent to, to read it. Um, what did I learn at Toyota? Well, the, this thing that I'm talking about, which is Genshi Genbutsu, which is go and see, essentially. Right. Go to the factory and see how it works. Don't ask questions, just observe. Go to the consumer, see how they use the product, right? So that's number one. Number two, long-term vision. 
Toyota didn't care about the next five years. Toyota cared about the next 50 years. So when you're in a business business that requires massive capital investment, at the time it cost a billion dollars to develop a car from beginning to scratch. It took eight years. Today it's faster and, and cheaper. But you know, what kind of company are you building for the next 100 years, 50, 100 years? Having that approach makes you make different choices than having a company that relies, for example, on venture capital, which we can get into and what that brings with it. Or if you're a publicly traded company that is responsible on a quarterly cycle to shareholders and quarterly reports, it changes the dynamics. So one of the things that makes Toyota super successful is very long-term vision and an infinite curiosity on what people actually are doing. Another, the last thing I'll mention to you is I learned at Toyota the five whys, right? So I would ask people why they did something when I did ask questions five times. So, Jeremy, why do you like wearing hats? Well, because it, you know, I think it looks good. Well, why do you think it looks makes you look good? Well, because this and the other, right? So, doing that allows you to get at the heart of the matter. And typically, and that's the biggest learning, it's not what you think it is. Mm. The thing that that gets you interested in and in, in the beginning, like, oh, that's a nice hat. For you, it's, it has nothing to do actually with the hat. It maybe is around an insecurity about being bald if I was wearing a hat, or maybe <laughs> it's about, you know, wanting to impress somebody or, you know, who knows. Um, and that's what you learn by by being curious. And Toyota is, as a company is innately curious about people. Mm. Yeah, it's um, that that five wise thing. I've read articles about that in terms of you know it's essentially how to do root cause analysis and things like that, isn't it? Um. Just a question then, in, in terms of, you mentioned that learning around long-term vision and, you know, 25 year or 25 year plus long-term planning and vision. How does that then compare to what you were saying earlier about you can actually advise the CEOs that you're working with to have more of a short-term outlook? So short-term, it's around product and service and market. Long-term is about company we want to build. Right. So uh, let's go back to the dating app analogy. If I was building a dating app, I would build whatever MVP I have and expose it to as many people as I could as fast as I could. That's the short term. Let's go out and, and actually see how people are going to use our product and service and then iterate on that. My long term vision would be to end um, sadness and depression because the world is going to a place where more and more people feel alone and isolated. And if I create a dating app that's successful in creating more healthy relationships with less divorces, for example, or less people who are single late in their 30s, early 40s, maybe women who want to start a family but can't alone or whatever, right? That's the long-term vision. Create a society of happier and healthier relationships for more people. That right. you can't do on a quarterly cycle. That you cannot do by changing the font in your app. That you can only do if the choices you make allows you to be around in 10, 15, 20 years. And so those, those, that's the difference. And because obviously that, that long-term vision is, is sort of based on societal problems as well. Does that mean that, you know, for example, with Toyota, when it was looking 50 years out and you were predicting that, that 50 years, does that mean they were looking for new problems to iterate their long-term vision as a company? No, they weren't necessarily looking for new problems. They were looking for understanding what were going to be the problems of the future, right? So mm. they understood the climate change impact way before anybody else. And so they started to develop these hybrid vehicles way before everybody else. And we, we successfully introduced a Prius in, in the United States during my tenure um, because they knew at some point we have to get off fossil fuels, fuels, and mm. we have a big say in that. At the time, Toyota was the biggest car company in the world. Mm. And so they took that responsibility very seriously. Yes, they will make money on those things, of course. But it was more about creating a world or making sure we had a world to be in yeah. in 50 to 100 years. Mm. Now, got it. So moving away from Toyota and, and kind of zooming in back to you, what has been, would you say, the most significant failure 
or business or setback within your kind of career? It's a good question. I, I've had a couple of, of failures. Some are business related and some are, are, are personal ones. And I, I'd start with the personal ones because that's the one that's been the most transformational, to be honest. So roughly four years ago now, uh, almost five years ago, really, um, I was the, the CEO of a, a Copenhagen-based autonomous vehicle operator. So we did self-driving cars. Uh, I had 70 employees in five countries. And after I'd run that company for three years, I um, came home from a skiing trip with my son. And the morning I should wake up, the Monday morning I should wake up and go to work, I was incapacitated. I thought I'd gotten a brain tumor. I simply could not move. Um, it turns out, and, and there's a longer story here and we can get into it if you're interested. Uh, it turns out that my brain and my body had shut down because of the stresses of building and running companies over the previous 15 years. And I was sidelined for six weeks. I was on sick leave. I went back to the office. My brain still didn't work. I couldn't compute what was happening in front of me. Um, I couldn't remember anything. I went back on sick leave, sick leave for another six weeks. And eventually my board fired me. Um, and, uh, and I was, you know, I was unemployed, I was without my company and I had to figure out what to do next. That was that a company that you had founded yourself or? No, that was a company that I, I joined as the first and only employee, a CEO. And then I built it from the ground up, but I did not, uh, get the title of co-founder. I still own equity in the business uh, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never heard of, uh, of stress having that much impact, uh, I mean, did did you have any pain, or was it just a sort of um, incapa incapacitation? Uh, yeah, no, I I didn't have any pain. It was, you know, the way that it's been described to me subsequently by doctors and psychologists is essentially we have a bunch of pipes in our brain, right? That's connecting left and right, and everybody else. Um, and it was like when the brain essentially said move, that signal didn't get to the rest of my body because the my right. my brain was clogged. The pipes were clogged, kind of like uh, water pipes in your house that get clogged, right? Um, so it was a really, really strange feeling. It was like there was a disconnect between mind and body and um, quite scary, to be honest. Mm, Thankfully, my like yeah, I have an older sister. She's a psychologist, as it happens. She happens to be an expert in... in um, mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction, what's called MBSR. And I called her that morning because uh, I didn't know who else to call. And she uh, she listened to my slurring voice and she came over uh, and she very quickly diagnosed me with, I think you're just suffering from stress. Of course, I got checked out by doctors and EKGs and all this other stuff. Mm. Um but, but she essentially helped me get better over the subsequent uh, three months. Yeah, because I, I suppose the obvious thing to think about, as you say, was a tumor or a stroke or something like that, right? Did you that ever cross your mind? The, the, that's what I thought, right? I, I didn't think. I didn't know anything. So it, this is a bit ironic, right? Because for the, sub, for, the, for the previous 15 years, I'd heard about people suffering from stress and, and stopping to work. And also back in Denmark, I was living in New York most of the time. And honestly, I thought a little bit like stress, really? I mean, how hard can it be to be a school teacher or a police officer or whatever it is that you're doing? You know, you have six weeks of vacation. So you're going to look at me. I'm building these companies I'm all over the world. I'm doing all this stuff. And then uni the universe has a wonderful way of showing you who's boss, right? Because then it turned around and said, buddy, I'm just going to put you in the place for a moment here and, and show you that, no, you're not this Superman that you, that you run around and think you are. And um, so I'm very thankful for the experience. To be honest, I'm in a much better place in many ways today than I've ever been. And I wouldn't be here without that. But when it happened, it freaked me out, right? I, I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. So. And you mentioned the word uh, superhuman or superman, one of the two. Was that your identity? And did you feel that your identity was taken away when you had that uh, kind of attack? I didn't think it was my identity. I didn't walk around thinking I was master of the universe. Other people might have looked at me and thought I thought that, so to speak, right? Because when you're, you know, look at Mark Zuckerberg or look at Steve Jobs or look at anybody, 
I'm a much, much smaller version of that. But, but typically company builders or founders have this air of everything's under control. I got it all figured out, you know, and, and we can get into, to, to why that's not the case for all of them or for all of us. Um, no, I, I just didn't, I, I didn't feel vulnerable. I didn't feel like anything could go wrong. I felt like I could handle all the challenges. And then all of a sudden there was a challenge I couldn't handle. And so what it did to me was it reset essentially over the subsequent months. It took therapy and all sorts of other stuff. It reset my understanding of who I was as a professional human being. Up until that point, I'd been 100% a professional human being. It was all about the companies, the business, the ideas. And after that, I became a much more balanced, much more whole human, which is, is the stuff that I do now, right? Understanding that nobody can go through life being 100% one thing. We all are a combination of personal and, and, and professional. And how did it feel to be sacked by your board? I was relieved. I was actually relieved. And I was relieved because... I realized that I was I'd been in a dysfunctional setup. Uh, my board had did not necessarily have my best interest or the company's best interest at heart. It was a structure where it was a corporate that owned the majority of the company, and so they assigned corporate executives as board members. And those guys, you know, in this case, were not the best stewards of the business because they were used to, to running inside a company. He's not used to building new things, which is what we were doing. You know? um, so when I, when, I, when I got fired, I think I was just like, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to be anywhere. I, you know, the previous year, I had been on a plane 172 times. In 30, uh, 365 days, I'd been flying more than 170 times. And so I, I, I was just like, it's over in some way, right? I can, I can relax now. Of course, over the subsequent months, I had a huge identity crisis. Like, who am I now that I'm no longer the CEO of this company? What will people think? What will my team think? Uh, why was I fired? Was I fired because I was sick? Was I fired because I didn't perform? You know, all those questions. Um, but in the moment, I was relieved. So was that a kind of crisis point that whole summer trying to, you know, trying to find your identity? I was, I was so sick, honestly, Jeremy, that it, I didn't have a lot of sort of conscious thoughts about that. I mostly just tried to survive and I don't want to sound dramatic, um, but, but my psychologist, the, the primary care person I had said, you can only do four things. You need to sleep as much as you possibly can because your system needs rest. You need to eat healthy three days a week, or three meals a, a day, sorry. Um, you need to get fresh air and exercise every single day. And you should not talk to other people about this than me because everybody will have an opinion. Everybody will want something from you and you should just shut them out and just deal with me about these issues. And so that's Sorry. what I mm. that's what I concentrated on doing. I didn't really think about anything else for the first few months. So the crisis was it was a a medical related crisis more than anything, and then the the identity bit came after that. Yeah, I, I think the best the best analogy is you you drive you, you know you have a car that only has fumes in the tank. If we're still talking about internal combustion engines, right? That car will struggle to drive anywhere and that's what I was doing I was struggling to kind of go through life at that point so how did you recover from that not physically but I'm more thinking about the I'm I'm more interested in the, the this identity piece because you know you talked about feeling kind of lost and obviously you mentioned the word you know before about being sort of superhuman and you, you know it sounded like you also cared about what other people thought and obviously you know being in those leadership positions for quite a number of years so that kind of sounds like you know you're at the top of the tree and then did it feel like you've been kind of you know toppled over and then you're sort of sliding on the bottom yes it, it felt like a 
well, at the bottom of the ocean in a way, <laughs> um, honestly, right? So I fell out of the tree and then I fell into an ocean and I had to find a way to get back up to the surface so I could breathe. Um, uh, and and so how did I do that? I, I, I went for long walks every single day. I, I lived near a forest. Um, and so I would drive out there every morning uh, after I started jumping in the ocean, honestly, I, I started swimming every day and I started going in, in, in the forest and I would just walk around that forest um, and I would think about what had happened. I would think about what that meant. I started discovering uh, stoicism and, and started reading a bunch of, of that stuff. Um, and then I realized that nobody cares. Honestly, we're so worried about what everybody else cares about uh, thinks of us but everybody else is busy with their own stuff, you know? And so I started understanding that it wasn't about them. It was about me. It was about what did I want to take from this experience? What kind of man, what kind of person did I want to be? What kind of legacy did I want to leave for my son one day? And it became a different story in my head about what mattered. I essentially learned, and there's a book now that says, how not to give a F star mm. CK, right? Mm. I essentially learned that on those walks. I learned to realize that it's, you know, if I go out into the world and I do something that's meaningful to me, then that's respectful to others. That's all I need to care about. Status of being the CEO of this or that company, you know, pretending to have everything under control, that, that, that vanished on those walks. I I started not caring about that stuff. I just wish I had had that experience when I was thirty and not almost fifty. So sounds a very kind of yeah powerful powerful insights really. And it took that experience to give you those. It it did, and and back to being thankful. Right, if I hadn't gotten sick, I'd still be trying to make that company work and battling and dealing with my board and being stressed out of my mind. So, so it was, I'm really thankful that it happened, honestly. And, and the doctor said it was good that it happened because if it had happened a few years later, my brain may not have been able to fully recover. I would have continued to have had like memory loss and slurred speech on occasion and fatigue and all the other things that comes with that kind of experience. So in many ways, it was good it happened when it did. And a question for me would be, because obviously this is, you know, kind of what you do now, but what what advice would you now give to people in that position or people in, you know, leadership positions? But I suppose it doesn't even, it doesn't even matter if they're in, you know, high, highfalutin corporate jobs. What advice would you kind of give to people? And I suppose it, it's a resilience piece in some ways, but it's also maybe looking after themselves in another to ensure that they don't get into that kind of situation and don't suffer that level of stress and obviously the impacts that came with it. I, I think it's a fairly complicated question and answer, honestly, right? Because it, it really depends on a lot of different conditions. Uh, and you're right. That is what I do today. That is most of my clients are in, in that situation and we're trying to avoid them getting to where I got. Um, I think it starts with asking yourself, am I the happiest I can be in my personal relationships and my professional relationships? And if the answer is not unequivocally yes, then make a change. You know, nobody's going to thank you at the end of your life, and we we all hear this, right? People are killing themselves in corporate jobs, literally, or in startup jobs, thinking that everybody else, you know, will will it'll be disappointing to them if you if you have to stop doing something. And, and so, what I try to teach, and and what advice I give is, are you extraordinarily excited about going to work most days, not every day, most days? And if the answer is not yes then you need to carefully reconsider what you're doing for a living. And then you need to start working on saying, accepting that, yeah, maybe I'm not going to be an investment banker like my dad wants me to be or a doctor like my mom thinks I should be. 
maybe I do want to be an artist or maybe I do want to be an entrepreneur or maybe I do want to be something else. Okay, how can I get there and how can I do that? Not just the physical steps and all the other stuff, but mentally, how can I accept with myself that maybe I can pursue my dream of becoming a painter rather than being a lawyer or whatever it is and then do it. A lot of people so, feel stuck, right? A lot of people feel like, oh, I have to do this. My answer is always, you don't have to do anything. You can sell that big fancy house. You know, you can provide for your family differently than you think you have to. The, the, the most important thing we have in life is honestly our health and happiness. And if you're sacrificing any of those two, you need to do something different. Yeah, it's the status thing, isn't it, as well? It's the ego and it's the uh, societal pressure. It, it is. And, and, you know, again, being a, a almost 50-year-old halfway in life, and we can talk about, uh, you know, midlife crisis and other stuff, right? One of the things I really try to impress upon younger people today, so people in their 20s starting their careers, is yes, it's great to have McKinsey on your resume or another prestigious company. Just make that choice with open eyes. Make the choice to work hard or in a stressful scenario because that's what you want to do, not because that's what you need to do. You don't need to do anything. But if you want to go have that experience, if you want to build a company and go through those trials and deprivations, by all means do it. But you cannot sacrifice your health and happiness. You know, just the other day I had a conversation with somebody who said, I just need to do this for another three years, then everything will be perfect. And, and I had to tell him like, you may not be here in three years. So let's talk about what you're going to do in the next three months to improve your situation. Mm, that's that's uh, it's a great way of looking at it and great advice. So I'm just going to also, yeah, move away from, from this sort of personal, um, uh, this story as well to, to back to, the other two you mentioned as well that you had a couple of other sort of business failures. I wanted to sort of explore those as well. Do you want to tell us about those? Yeah, so so there there are two slightly different ones. One is a classic. Didn't know our 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 market. We didn't get mark, product market fit. So I started a record label uh, a long time ago, and and you can think how hard is it to know your market? You put out a record and people like it or they don't. But the twist on ours was we did a crowdsourcing setup where the members of our record label, because our users would be members, uh, could have input on what the band or the bands should do. For example, they would have recorded 11 songs. This is back when we still had CDs, right? Um, which song should be the single or on the LP or which song should be, you know, what should the sequence of stories be or uh, where should this band tour, that kind of thing. So the idea was let's get people involved closer to the artist, get them an experience. This is before Instagram and all these other things that that's happening today. So in principle, a great idea. You give people access to mm -hmm. something that they deeply care about, you know, true fans, get them involved, go off you go. Why did that business fail? Well, it failed because we thought we could get a creative entity, a band, to give away a little bit of that secret sauce in the creative process against tying their fans closer to that. And creative people are creative and fans are not necessarily creative. So similar to a website designer saying, hey, do you like this? And you say, I'd like the font to be bigger. And they kind of go like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Telling an artist that Johnny, 69, you know, was one of our members, think you should, uh, you know, tour this venue in Ohio when there's no chance in hell you want to go to Ohio. That's just not going to work. So we didn't have product market fit. We spent uh, almost two years trying to get there and, and we failed. Um, so that was the first one. And that one hurt because... I really loved the music and my partner really loved the music. Um, and and a few years later, somebody else succeeded essentially with the same idea. So we were just too early, but that was, really? that was my first failing. So what, um, did you have a lot of uh, staff in that? What did that setup look like? 
No, that was a very lean business. We were five people in that company. Um, mm. And we didn't invest a ton of money, so it wasn't one of those either. It was just, I think it was more ego thing, to be honest. Right. Like, I, I, you know, I will, I wanted to will this thing to work, but I couldn't control, obviously, our, our members, and I couldn't control the band. So I was trying to create a marketplace of ideas, but I couldn't control the inputs and the outputs. And, and so not succeeding, you know, was painful because I, I guess I realized that no matter, you know, I'd been used to before that point, I'd been used to, if I applied myself, I could succeed, right? In this case, I applied myself and I didn't succeed, but it was because of factors beyond my control. I just didn't realize that when it was happening and that's why it hurt so much. So what was, do you think was the biggest mistake you made in that failure? Uh... Well, there's there's a couple. I think the biggest mistake was to believe that others would do what they said they would do, right? Mind you, I that's how I I kind of grew up. You know, you do what you say you're going to do, and and uh, trusting. I I I think I it was a, a I trusted that my that my bands would do what we agreed that they would do. This is not about having legal structures or contracts and stuff because we had all those things. But this was a failure on my part of not seeing that human behavior would always trump what might be in a contract. So it was those who weren't doing what you said. It wasn't the customers. It wasn't the assumptions you were making about customers doing different behaviors. It was the bands, which is obviously your key product. It's exactly right. It's like selling shampoo and, and the shampoo actually not cleaning your hair, right? <laughs> um that, that you're not going to be in business for very long, and that's mm. that's what happened with ours. The the product, the, what we were selling to the to the buyers, didn't deliver. But that wasn't their fault. That was our fault because we hadn't seen that. That of course would be the case because creative people are not going to hand over part of the creative process, no matter what, how much we we encourage them to do so. And what was the second mistake? You said there was two. Uh, the second mistake was it, it wasn't a full-time venture for my business partner. He had other business interests at the same time. Um, and that's something I think happens a lot. People start things on the side and then there's disagreements around how much you need to commit to it. Mm. He had a very successful business and this was kind of a pet project for him. The, the second mistake was we should have earlier on committed more resources to actually doing this because a lot of times we got delayed or, or things didn't happen because he didn't have the resources to commit to it. And we were 50-50 partners. Um, I was all in on it and I just couldn't do it on my own. I'm not what blaming did... him. I'm, I'm, I'm not pushing the blame out. It, it may sound a little bit like that here. Um, the failing was, was on my part for not sitting us down and saying, if we're going to do this, we both have to do it 100% of the time. Otherwise, it's not going to work. But committing more resource to that business, what difference would have that have made in the outcome? We would have gotten different kinds of bands on there quicker that we might have been able to convince this to, to do this. Um, we could have pivoted the model. Maybe it shouldn't be a creative input model. Maybe it should have been, you know, what Kickstarter, which you may know the Kickstarter platform or Indiegogo, those came around like at the tail end of us doing that business. And so essentially we could have maybe pivoted to a model where fans could support their bands early in the process, get access to exclusive content, videos, you know, their name on the on the sleeve of the CD or on the tour t-shirt, things like that. That pivot we may have been able to make if we had actually spent more time thinking about what we could do with the, the bands that we had and the audiences that we had, but we didn't get there. Mm. Yeah, because that model is quite prevalent now, and there's um, there's the big uh, there's the big platform as well as Kickstarter, the other one, and uh, I can't remember the name of. Um, there's Indiegogo, which is another one. There's there's a few of them now. Um, yeah, and it's a nice it's a nice business for the people sitting in the middle. And you mentioned that you were too early as well. You mentioned that someone managed to make it work later on. Yes. Was that exactly the same business model? No, because they didn't require the bands to actually allow creative input. They did 
what Kickstarter does. They right. allow people to buy different packages that would give them mm. different privileges, uh, but in the musical in in the music space. Um, and that's why I said, could we have figured that out? Maybe if we had spent enough time on it together. I wasn't a musical expert. My partner was, right? He was a big manager for big acts. Right. Uh, so he knew the industry. He'd been an A&R manager at record labels. He knew the industry very, very well. Um, I was the, the commercial person, the, the company building person. He didn't have experience doing that. Um, and so that that didn't turn out too good. And you mentioned that one really hurt. Tell me about that. Well, did it hurt? Was it your, your, I mean, you think you said your ego. Yeah, it, it hurt my ego because I, I think I couldn't, you know, I thought I could will my way to success because at that point I'd only been successful. It was kind of my first failure. Um, and the second thing is I felt like I let down a bunch of people. I let down all these fans that had given us their money to get close to the acts that we had promised them they would get close to. And then when that didn't happen, I had to turn around saying, sorry, uh, I know you're paying us $29 a month to do this. Uh, it's not going to happen. Here's your money back, whatever we had left of it, because we did start paying people back. Um, it's a big idea for me, Jeremy. This, you know, if you promise something, you you damn well better do it. And back then, I maybe made bigger promises that I could keep. And I don't do that anymore. Hmm. So, because you mentioned that came from from y your parents, yeah, I, I uh, it actually came from my grandfather. I have a fairly unusual last name, Sorgenfry, right? It's not Smith. It's it's not very common at all. And so, no matter where I go in the world, my grandfather said, "Make sure you do what you say you're going to do. Make sure you behave because of your last name, people will remember you." And so uh, that's been a core tenet of, of my growing up and, and still is today. Um, and I think I felt, uh, I felt at that time with that company that I had, uh, my reputation would suffer because I had done something and people would remember me as the guy who didn't deliver. Did it? No, nobody cares. <laughs> Did you come out of that? the kind of like licking your wounds so because you I mean because you said it was your first failure like how did you then get back on on the horse so to speak the business horse and and you know because of that being your your first one and it being a bit of a kick to your ego and then you worrying about your reputation yeah like I I got back on the horse because back to to the the, the earlier part of our conversation because somebody else I knew had about another business idea mm. and I was like I like this idea let's let's go do that um, and it was, that was when I got into a, a perfume business, which was online retail. Uh, it wasn't about selling a promise uh, of something to happen. It was about selling a product that we had in the hand. Um, so it was more about how do you optimize marketing and how do you optimize, you know, positioning and branding and that kind of thing. Um, and so I got into that business and didn't really think about the community business, the record label. Uh, much after that, um, I did lose touch with my partner, which, you know, we're not, we're not, not friends, but it was quite clear that for him, this was an experiment. And for me, it, it was supposed to be a part of my legacy. And so we had different, uh, impressions of, of what that was going to be. Interesting. So do you think that was also part of why it failed as well? Because actually you weren't necessarily aligned as business partners as to your kind of longer term goals and how you were seeing that business. Absolutely. And, and, and a uh, good spot. At, and, and that's also one of the things I preach today, right? When you meet a co-founding couple or, you know, people doing businesses together, that's one of the conversations you need to have in the beginning, right? Not just we're building some cool stuff, but what do we want this thing to be? How are we each individually contributing? What is our commitment? And so when I meet people who, you know, oh yeah, I have this guy, he's going to work on it part time. I'm like, hold on, let's, let's just make sure that you know what that means. Because I know from experience on my own body, but also from the hundreds of, of CEOs and founders I've met over the years, that's going to be a problem. Um, 
and but I but I also just the last twist on this is I also it it also hurt because I would want everybody to love what we did right and I would want it to work out um and so him and me not working out was was kind of like a, a little bit of a, a divorce in a way uh which I which I felt was painful so there's the kind of yeah personal aspect of, of that as well um and you mentioned earlier about the dysfunctional board at the um the self drive yeah. startup and you also mentioned offline that there was also another business failure when you had a dysfunctional board is that the same story or is that two separate things that's a that's a separate story so to so the one where uh, we had a startup that failed um uh, was because we had um we had a board which consisted of uh, essentially three friends who had known each other for 20 odd years, but not never done a business together. And so they decide to to launch this thing and co-invest. And I then came on as CEO after they'd been going for, for a year and a half, two years. The reason I came on was because they were trying to save the company and needed somebody who was more commercial. And, and so in, in I come. Um, the failing there was the investors at critical junctions couldn't agree on. So the investors and the board were the same people. They couldn't agree on contributing the funding required for the company to get to the next level of product development. Um, and they spent so much time essentially heckling each other or ignoring each other over 13,000 euros 13,000 euros is yeah I don't know if you want to translate but it's not a lot of money in it's the context of the 11,000 pounds yeah yeah there you go um so much so that they don't speak to each other today and this is now 10 years later right almost um and so what did I learn from that well one of the things I learned is having having friends doing business is something you have to be really cognizant of, both on the founding team, which happens a lot. You know, two guys say, or two people say, let's start a company, we're friends, that'll work out. But also on the investor and the board side, mixing your personal relationships and friendships with business is something I, I caution people against every single day. Um, just because he's your friend doesn't mean he's a good co-investor. Uh, and you have to be aware and accept that your friendship may go by the wayside if you start a company together or if you invest in a business together. Um, it is very hard for people to separate the two things when things go become difficult, and things do become difficult in all companies at some point. And how did that uh, that kind of business implode from that disagreement over that 13,000 euro investment. We couldn't make pay. We couldn't make salaries. We ran out of cash because we were developing a new, so we, essentially it was recruitment solution. Uh, it was kind of like a match or a combination of LinkedIn and, and Instagram, a very visual thing. I didn't explain the details if you're interested, but so we were selling that to corporates. Bank of America, American Express, Barclays, those kind of places, financial services. Um, and so we're, we needed to develop the platform to deliver on some of those potential contracts. So essentially, we had sold what this platform was going to do before we'd actually built it. And so we couldn't build it, and we hadn't collected the, the revenue yet. Uh, and so we had developers who needed to build it, but because they couldn't agree on the funding, we actually could not pay the developers. These were overseas developers that we had. And so we had to let them go. And so we couldn't deliver what we wanted, what we had sold to the customers. And so we didn't have any customers. And so eventually the board was just like, this fight that we're having is getting too much. I don't want to be in business with with this mm -hmm. investor. The investors mm -hmm. said to each other. And so we couldn't we couldn't move on and, and the company had to go into bankruptcy and then be closed. What do you think you should have done? Or what were you pushing for at the time to be uh, to be the decision to move forward? Break up the investor base uh, and the board. So take on somebody else as a new investor so that we would have a different dynamic in the boardroom. So instead of three equal owners, I would want to take on a new 
uh, either majority or almost majority investors so that we would have a, a different balance in the boardroom. Um, but the problem is when you have challenges in the investor group or at the board, new investors will not come into your company because they will smell that a mile away. And startups are still a small community, even in London, a big city like London. So everybody talks to everybody. And so what I didn't realize at the time, I didn't know at the time, was one of our investors had a reputation of being difficult. Um, and so we could not raise additional capital as long as this person was part of the ownership. All right. Was there anything that you regretted on that that you think you should have done? Yes. I should have done my due diligence on the board members. You know, I should not have taken the CEO role without understanding exactly who these people were and what their uh, reputation was. Um, on paper, from the outside world, and still the case today, they looked like very successful business people. And they are, to some degree, they've just gotten that success on the back of a bunch of failures and broken relationships. I did not do my due diligence. I should have. So if somebody on listening to this is considering joining a startup in a leadership position, one of the most important things you can do outside of understanding everything about the company and the product and the, whatever you're doing is actually interrogate who the investors and the board are. Not just looking at their resumes, but talking to people who know them and who've done business with them in the past. I did not do that, and that was a mistake. And a couple of things stood out in when you were saying that was one a, a similarity between the music startup was that, and I don't know if it was happened before you kind of got there, but given that you were talking about the thing about letting people down and not uh, over promising, you were sent that second startup essentially did that right because you built you built an app uh, or, or the platform before you'd sorry you'd sold the platform before you'd even built it yeah we, we'd sold it we hadn't collected right so we'd sold the idea right. and right. saying hey right. we're going to do this do you want it yes we do okay we'll do it we'll come back to you in a couple of months um i think the difference if this is where your question is going i felt personally connected to the members of the record label those were individuals, you know, that was Susan, Bob, Janie, whomever. I knew them. We kind of had a dialogue with them. We rode with them, you know. We, we, we didn't meet them necessarily physically, but I felt like I knew them. Those were, those were people like you and me. The other business was different because that was Bank of America or American Express or, you know, the HR group at Barclays, whatever it was. Um, and so it felt more distant. It felt like it was, I was sold something to an entity. I didn't sell something to a human. Um, yeah. and for that reason, it, it was different. Mm. And what were the, the similarities and differences between the two dysfunctional boards as well? Um, I think the, the differences was the, the, the startup in London, the recruitment business with the investor situation. That was professional investors. That was people who are used to startups um, who, for reasons of personality, couldn't get along. That was not the case in the self-driving car board. The self-driving car board consisted of corporate executives from an industrial player who was the main owner investor. People who had a day job as running divisions in that company and then their side job was being boards of my new little startup that was running inside of the business. Those guys, it was all guys, uh, those guys did not have any incentive to make me succeed because I represented essentially a threat to their business model because they were in the business of selling cars, so individual boxes. I was in the business of selling trips, so fewer boxes shared by more mm. people, mm. like a car sharing platform essentially. Yeah. And so if I were succeeding, they would be selling fewer cars in the future. And so, you know, they didn't, and that was one thing. The other thing was the company owners, these are three private families who own the company, gave me 
a lot of money to start this company and build it, while at the same time asking my board members to reduce their expenses in their business so that they could fund the future. So essentially, they were asking my board to lay off people, to stop initiatives, so that I, Peter, could go spend money on some future that may or may not happen. So imagine this, right? Mm. The CEO that you're sitting and, and supposed to look out for gets in, in pounds, um, two million pounds, yet I'm asked to save five million pounds over here. That doesn't necessarily make you happy when Peter walks into the room saying, guys, I have this great idea about drones. I think we should do autonomous drones to windmill farms with equipment because we figured out that that's something we can do, right? So it's a complete conflict of interest, basically. Absolutely. Um, and, and then also, you know, humans are humans. I was a pretty sexy commodity in that business. I was the one that they put out on stage. I'm like, look at this. Look at how innovative we are. And, you know, I got a bunch of accolades and I was in the news and all this other stuff. And these guys were essentially being hit over the head every single day, asking to save money and didn't get credit, didn't get credit for, for the stuff that I got credit for. So, you know, that was just a difficult situation for them to accept. And, and as a result, you know, I often get asked the question, could your board have seen you suffering from stress and breaking down? Shouldn't your board have kind of said, hey, wait a minute, Peter, are you okay? And the answer is they should have. Because at many occasions, I said things like, guys, things are going great. We're firing all cylinders, but I feel like I'm the pilot of a jetliner, but I'm hanging out on the wing looking into the cockpit and there's nobody at the wheel. That's how I feel. I said that in the boardroom. Wow. And a board member should have said, hold on. Do you need help? Do you need something from us? Can we take care of you in a way so that this doesn't end badly? Because clearly it feels like you're not in control. Mm -hmm. Nobody did that at any point. I don't blame them because they, they weren't in that mindset. They didn't have that experience. But professional board members today of any VC funded or, or, or private equity funded company, professional board members today see that stuff and stop it. My board didn't because they weren't professional board members. They were corporate executives. Do you find or have you found in the past those CEO, CEO roles quite lonely and isolating? Absolutely. It's the loneliest job in the world. Why is it? Why? Because you don't feel like you can talk to anybody about all the, the difficult things you're going through. A lot of CEOs today have, like me, they're, you know, they have a coach or they have a mentor, they have an advisor and stuff. But the big thing is there's so much personal stuff going on, whether it's imposter syndrome that people now know about. But, you know, who do you go to when you're like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, my relationship at home is bad. My, my team doesn't trust me. My board is on my case. My investors. Who do you talk to about that stuff? No one. Which is also why the, the, the business I do today has seen a fair amount of success because every single founder I get in touch with is like, finally, <laughs> a place I can go where somebody gets me and understands what I'm going through and can help me manage and navigate that, right? Um, that's why I started. I, I was like, if I had somebody like me back then, I don't think I would have been in that situation. Yeah, do you think that you, you would have not had that, that, that whole incident with the stress and everything that followed? Depends on how early I would have started having mm. a relationship, mm. right? I don't think I could have avoided it. And as I said earlier, I actually am thankful that it happened. Mm. Um, I, I think people today, even now, five, six years later, people are much smarter about the importance of mental health and mental well-being than, than we were or that I was. Um, so I don't think I could have avoided it. But I certainly think that I could have had an easier time recovering and I also think I could have had a better time leading up to it. Um, you know, when I speak to clients today, within a few weeks, they come back to me and I'm like, I'm relieved, I'm happier, things are going well. Still a lot of challenges, both in the business and personally, but I kind of now know that there is a path out of this or or through this, right? Um, and I, and I kind of wish that I would have had 
that experience. And I'm just intrigued as well. That's the the recruitment firm in London that uh, startup that didn't work. How did the the feeling of that not working compare to the the, the feeling of the music business? I know you said it for, it wasn't as kind of personal because you didn't have the the community aspects to it, but I'm I'm thinking about it as well because obviously the first one was the was your first failure, mm-hmm. um, and then the, then obviously you had the second one which was your second business failure. So how did you feel in comparison between those two? It was less about it being the second one and I having experience with failure. It the second one felt like it was beyond my control because it was mm-hmm. investors, you know, complaining to each other and not figuring out their relationships. So the second one felt a little more disjointed for me. It wasn't personal. It was about them. The first one felt very personal because it was about something that I hadn't foreseen and done Mm. in a different way. And I let a bunch of people down that I cared about. You know, that, that rich investors can agree over petty stuff. I, I didn't really, I wasn't really bothered about that. I was, I was upset because I wanted the product to live. I had, um, a CTO and co-founder uh, that I was and still am a huge fan of. And he had been there from the beginning. He was kind of the genius child that had figured this stuff out. I was upset about him not seeing his dream realized. And I actually think it affected and impacted him to a much greater extent than it did me. And what have you kind of, from all of those setbacks and failures that we've been talking about today, what have you taken away from those that you've now implemented into your future kind of businesses and what impact has that had? Well, I've taken, I've taken away that you need to take care of yourself first. And it's not about being egotistical. It's about sort of checking yourself, having control of, of, of why you're doing what you're doing, understanding what you can control and not control as we talked about with the first business right back to stoicism there's only two things we control in life essentially it's our actions and how we relate to our thoughts what you're going to do what the market is going to do what the product is going to do beyond our control so that's one thing to sort of have a more balanced approach to what is within control um the second thing i i think i want to highlight is understanding who you're working with Right. I spent much more time now really getting under the skin of the people involved in the business. And we all know this, right? We all know, oh, you should work with the best people and stuff. Yes, we say it, but do you actually understand who it is that you're getting mm. to bed with, so to speak? But uh, how do you do that? Is there a process that you follow in terms of, yeah, to, yeah. Well, what does it look like? Do you have a, a set of questions that you ask? You know, what, 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 what does that look like? I, the same way I recruited in my last company, I, I do the same thing now is how much time we spend together. You know, you and I have spoken now for a little more than 90 minutes or so. Um, would I go into business with you right now? Absolutely not. But if I'd spend- I want to say it day, personally. No, but I don't know you from Adam, right? You no, seem of course. Like, yeah. You seem like a clever person. You seem like you have good ideas. You certainly built this podcast. You know, you're, you're, you're an accomplished professional. But I want to know how you are at home. I want to know stuff about your family. I want to know about your siblings. I want to spend time with you. So I think the way I do it today is I just spend time with people and I don't actually rely on recommendations by others. I wouldn't go out Mm. to network and say, is this a guy I should get into business with? Because most of the people you would have sent me would say yes. And those who would say no, it's for reasons that, again, I don't know anything about. So... I would just spend time with you talking like this, going for the proverbial beer. Um, I don't drink alcohol anymore, but you know, alcohol free beer is also fine at the pub. Um, and then see, okay, do I get this person? Do I get what actually motivates you? Why are you doing this with me? Does it have to be me? Should it be somebody else? Um, what is it that drives you? Do we have the same values? And you can only decipher that by spending time. It's not about questions in an interview or questions in a conversation. It's longitudinal data. So 
I now take much longer time hiring people and getting into business with people than, than most people you'll meet. But my experience has taught me that that's what creates successful outcomes. Um, and that's also what I counsel people in that are hiring, right? Like spend more time than you think you need with the people and then spend a little bit more. And once you've done that, make sure that you understand all these things before you give them an offer to join you as an investor or as a board member or as, as an employee. But I suppose that, and that sounds a great approach, but there's always a, a risk of, or a small chance that that's still not going to work out right. Because those behaviors people can, you know, put on fronts and, you know, those behaviors that you might see within a business environment may be different to the ones they've displayed with you. Do you, do, would you agree with that? Or do you think that your method is, is, is a lot more robust? I, I agree with you. But that just means that I would want to see you in a professional context before we get into a professional context together. I, it would, it would, it would, you know, I would ask you, like you're interviewing me today. I would be interviewing you about your past dealings. I would listen for cues on, you know, where did you go wrong? What did you do wrong? What kind of responsibility do you did you carry for that failure or for that success? Um, and and so, you know, every situation would be an interview, even if we're just chatting, walking down the street, or if we're drinking beer or whatever we're doing. Um, it is not foolproof, no. So when people get into a situation where they're like, this person is not what I thought they would be, this is not working out in this context, the thing I counsel is do something about it immediately. Hey, buddy, um, I don't think this is going to work out for these reasons. A lot of people don't do that because they're afraid of the conflict, right? They don't want to tell their co-founder that they don't think that they're the right co-founder. Uh, for example, that's mostly the scenarios that I get into. But the kindest thing you can do to somebody else is to make sure that they also live a happy and healthy work life. And if you're not happy, chances are they're also not happy. They may not know it yet, but chances are that they're not in the right spot. And so the best thing you can do for you and for them is to quickly bring it up, try to deal with it, maybe get help from a, somebody like me or somebody else, and then figure out what the right path forward is but do it fast. That's good advice. So those failures and as we discussed, the that stress incident, did that ever like knock your confidence at all? And you thought, actually, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't, you know, I, I'm, I can't run businesses or I can't fi- found businesses. Did you ever have any doubts like that after those incidents? I, I don't want to say no categorically. But I don't remember thinking I, I couldn't do another business. Um, but I think that's mostly because I actually wasn't so calculated about it. Back to, you know, ideas would come to me and be like, all right, let's try and do that. You know, uh, could I have ended up in a situation where I would have taken a corporate job because I had to, to make some money and, and stay there? Absolutely. That just didn't happen for, for other reasons. Um so I don't want to make it sound like I, I had it all figured out. I think there are moments of doubts, but I don't remember questioning my own ability to such an extent that I would stop doing this. The thing is, for some people, me certainly, once you've been in charge, once you've been in control of your own destiny, it's very hard to give that up and rely on a corporation to take care of you. Um, and I see that in many other founders. I mean, it's it's kind of like once you go out and found your first company, maybe if you founded two companies, then there's no way you, there's no way you're going back. A lot of people start something and then maybe go back, but if you've done it twice, then typically you stay on the outside. And that's because one of the things that drives entrepreneurs is having the ability to essentially impact and control the kinds of problems that they work on and the people that they work on them with. Um, and I think that's the same for me. And what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs about how to handle a fear of failure? Because I think that holds a lot of people back from starting businesses that they don't want to fail. They don't want the shame of failing. I hear that word a lot. So what would you say to that? I, I, first thing, realize you're going to fail. You will fail. And, and that's 
okay. So, you know, you you will also get fired if you have a corporate job. Chances are you'll get fired at some point, and that will cause other questions about your abilities, right? So realize, number one, you will fail. Number two, make sure you don't make bets that are not reversible in some way, right? So do not mortgage your house, your parents' house, you know, take crazy financial risk before you've kind of proven that what you're doing is something that can sell and ideally don't ever take that risk, right? So don't, don't, don't put yourself in a situation that's unrecoverable, essentially financially. Um, and then third would be, as you're doing this, you realize that a lot of people will have opinions about what you're doing. Like, oh, is that a good idea or not? And you're worried about them being right. But the thing is, you experience when you fail, nobody comes to you and says, see, I said you're going to fail. But a lot of people come to you and saying, wow, you tried. I'm sorry to hear that it didn't work out. What are you going to do now? How can I support you? Do you need a help getting a job? Do you need financial support? You know, so people are generally, the people that you need to care about, care about you when you fail. All the people that you don't need to care about, that you're worried will have an opinion, won't have an opinion because they will be on to something else. Nobody gives a, at the end of the day. Um, and so it's a tough one, right? Because we all go through life caring about the opinions of a lot of people as teenagers, you know, what is what are my classmates things and whatever it is. As we get older, we realize that none of that matters. If we treat others kindly, if we have love in our life from family, friends, whatever else doesn't matter. Mm, that's great advice. So kind of wrapping up and final question. If you could go back in time and erase all of those failures and setbacks from happening, would you do that? Nope. I, I wouldn't. I'm, you know, I've learned a ton from having done the things and having failed the way that I failed that I wouldn't want to be without. Um, I don't, I don't believe anybody will go through life without challenges. You know, it's called homosis essentially, right? We, we're, we're, something is broken, it gets fixed and it gets stronger in our body. It's the same thing with building companies. I wrote something on, on LinkedIn the other day about, the fact that I would actually not invest in somebody who hasn't hit rock bottom. I would not go support somebody who hasn't experienced failing. Because if you've only met success in your life, the second you meet resistance and failure, you may break to a degree that you cannot rebuild. And as a person, as a human, I don't think you deserve that. I think you should be in a position to actually survive and rebuild. And as a business, you want somebody who who can stand up even if they've been knocked down too many times, right? Um, so no, I wouldn't have been without those experiences. And just um, curious as well, when you say you won't invest in companies or people that haven't reached rock bottom, how big a failure does that need to be? How big a, you know, it, is that literally rock bottom, the one, you know, similar to what you had faced or is it, you know, some setbacks along the way in their businesses, some challenges in their business? I appreciate that you asked for that clarification because it's an important one. And, and no, it's not rock bottom like I experienced. But it's but it's somebody who has experienced some kind of setback or, or not success. And we're not talking about going outside and it's raining and forgetting your umbrella, right? We're talking about, if you look at the biggest entrepreneurs today, if you look at the biggest companies builders today, they have had significant challenges at some point or another, whether it's in their early childhood um, there's many founders who, who come from dysfunctional homes, for example, that's a setback. There's many company builders who've had bankruptcies and succeeded afterwards. There's many founders who've had uh, challenges in their personal relationships and succeeded or, or business relationships. So it's more about having sort of gotten your, your, your limits tested, uh, on a personal level and figured out how to navigate through that. There's a lot of, of athletes that are building companies, you know, um, because they kind of know themselves. I think maybe that's the point actually, Jeremy, is how well do you know yourself? Mm. And how well do you do you manage when 
when you're knocked down. I think those are the markers of, of people who are able to build successful companies. Interesting clarification. Great. Well, um, we always end on a quick fire round. So this is short questions and short answers. So question one, failure is? Not reaching your objectives. What's your life's mission? To make uh, sure that more people have a happy and healthy work life. What's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to others on your deathbed? Make sure you love what you do. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. Jumping in the ocean 365 days a year. Wow. With a wetsuit or without? Without. Butt naked. Now you have uh, that image in your head. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> if you could be immortal, would you take it? No. Why not? Because I believe we all have a time and a place and a role to play in the greater universe. And I don't think uh, we shouldn't continue with the renewal that comes with new minds and new ideas being brought into the world. You might have already answered this one, but uh, what's one surprising fact that not many people know about you? I tried out for the American Ballet in Paris uh, many years ago, and the surprising fact is they didn't pick me. <laughs> and who's a person that you think I should um, have on as a guest? Oh, I, I have a long list. Um, I think you should speak to uh, one of my clients, actually, um, who has gone through a tremendous development with their company and is now facing potentially their biggest failure of their career. All right. Great. Um, we can connect offline about that because it's yeah, like I, if they're, I don't if they're, if they're mid now. failure. Yeah, exactly. If they're mid failure, you probably don't want to make that public. So, Peter, where can people find you and connect with you? I'm easy to find. My name is Peter Sorgenfry, and maybe we should spell that somewhere in your material. We'll put that in the show notes, no problem. Yep. Yep, because that's a, a last name that not many people have, as I said. So petersorgenfry.com or just Peter Sorgenfry on LinkedIn or in the web. I have YouTube channels. I have LinkedIn. I have a website. I have all social stuff where people can read and see videos of me talking about being a founder and CEO and how to uh, do that better than maybe you're doing today. Amazing. Well, it's been a really enjoyable um, 90 minutes. And yeah, I, 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 you know, we could have spoken for double that length of time. So thank you for all of the insights that you have given today and all of the difficult subjects that you've talking about, have spoken about. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.